Good morning, and welcome to the Brattleboro Citizens Breakfast. We received an offer from Fred Harrison, administrator at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, Center for Wound Healing. Uh, a message that may not apply to everyone, but a message nevertheless that's very important for people with a wound that won't heal. For them, everyday activities can be a challenge, whether going for a walk or going shopping. A non-healing wound can be more than an annoyance. It can mean restricted activities and another day of pain or discomfort. There's a program at the hospital which attempts to get at this issue of chronic non-healing wounds. And Fred Harrison will talk to you today about that. I want to thank everybody for coming out on such a cold day. Uh, I'm from the Wound Care Center over at Brattleboro Hospital. Um, very proud of the, the center. I do have to qualify myself. I'm not a physician or a nurse. So I can't diagnose, I can't assess, uh, I can just give you information and opinion, but my opinion is not medical advice. I just want to put that out there. So uh, again, when I say something, please follow up with a physician. Um, we have a, a very diverse panel of physicians that work at the Wound Center. Uh, Greg Gadowski, a surgeon, is our medical director. Dr. Branos, a orthopedic surgeon, is on our panel. Uh, Carolyn Taylor Olson, primary care, is on our panel. Uh, Dr. George Heidelkoff, um, Dr. Uh, Remy uh, Damasco, uh, also primary care, is on our panel. And Dr. Fred Landis, uh, he's an ER doctor. So we have a very diverse panel of physicians. And what these physicians do is talk to each other about cases. So you want a diverse background of, of physicians when you're a patient and they're talking about your case. Um, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about what we can't do at the wound care center, uh, what we're not equipped to do. And that is, if you cut yourself, uh, if you're doing chainsaw, if you're trying to take snow out of your snow blower, and you slice your hand open, we're not the place to go, okay? You go to the ER first. You stabilize the wound first. Um, I just want to be clear on that so nobody drives up to the wound care center bleeding and saying, hey, you need to fix this wound, okay? We, we can't do that. Um, as a matter of fact, we don't do wounds that are self-healing, honestly. Um, and by that I mean if somebody is a healthy individual and they cut themselves uh, and you slap some, uh, you clean it up, put some Neosporin on it, put a Band-Aid on it, and it's healed, you don't need to come to the wound center, okay? What we do take care of are wounds that are not healing. And by that I mean, and this is just a general rule of thumb, if somebody, uh, if you or somebody you know has a wound that isn't healing within three weeks, there's an underlying cause for that, okay? And those are the type of, of, of patients that we need to see at the wound center. Don't ignore that, there's an underlying cause. So the reason for that is, and I'll give you some different types of examples of wounds that we deal with. Number one, diabetic ulcers. Uh, in the United States, there's currently about 26 million type two diabetic uh, patients in the, in the US. Out of those 26 million, about 15% will get diabetic ulcers, okay? And because of cardiovascular issues, that are inherent in diabetic patients, those wounds will not heal on their own. And the reason that they usually don't heal on their own, well, 99% of the time, is because lack of blood flow or perfusion to that wound, okay? So lack of blood flow or oxygen getting to a wound is the, is the primary reason for non-healing. Uh, again, diabetic ulcers, number one. Uh, another one is, uh, venous insufficiency ulcers, uh, which is uh, cardio issues, uh, 
cardio issues. If patients have uh, um, uh, poor cardiology or poor uh, uh, heart <coughs> issues, a lot of times there is a uh, insufficient supply of blood to extremities on their body, okay? Uh, and that causes, again, just wounds to, uh, uh, to not heal and to expand. Again, so venous insufficiency is another one. And also pressure wounds. Um, pressure wounds happen quite a bit from this uh, uh, issue called neuropathy. Uh, again, a big term, neuropathy for nerve damage. Uh, what that's all about is uh, if you can't feel in your extremities, that is usually neuropathy. If you can't feel, pain is good. If you have a wound somewhere and you're walking on it, you tend to limp because you tend to stay off it. Um, if you don't have that sensation of pain, you're going to continue to walk on it. Well, again, that just makes it a, a worse issue. And it expands the wound. So those are our top three. Again, I just want to clarify that you know we're not uh, a place like a band-aid station. We're a place that if somebody's wound is not healing, that's when you come to us. Now we have a very good record of healing those those types of wounds. Uh, we have a 93% heal rate. Okay. And the, our median days to heal are about 30 days. So in a relatively brief period of time, we have a very high success rate. Um, and again, it, it stands out because these are wounds that are just not healing on their own. Now let me give you some different uh, reasons or things that we do with the wound center uh, for that kind of success rate. Um, number one, again, as I was talking about before, a lack of blood supply to the wound is the uh, major reason that wounds do not heal. So what we do at the wound center is this term called debridement, okay, and that's a medical term for, and I guess as a layperson, uh, it's the way I think of it, removing debris. In other words, you're trying to enhance capillary growth, you know, so oxygen and, and blood gets to the wound, to do that you remove obstacles, debris, and that's where the doctor comes in and, and basically does a surface debridement where they take away with, with uh, instruments, they take away uh, waste, and I don't want to get too graphic because you're eating, but uh, in other words, they clear the path for capillary growth. There's surface debridement, debridement there's excisional debridement, which is where they go deep, and then there's surgical debridement, where they have to actually take you to an OR and, and uh, because of the pain or whatever, and uh, do a real number on you. So there's three types of debridements. So they're removing uh, tissue to, a, to enhance capillary growth. That's number one. There's also, again, getting back to pressure wounds, when I said with neuropathy, where people are not limping on something, they're, they're using it. Um, you do what they call offloading, which is a sounds like a dockyard term, but what that means is you put a cast on that basically shifts the pressure, say off your heel where there might be a wound, to the ball of your foot. So you can't, you have to stay off the wound. That's called offloading. So they use casts, and they use vacuum casts and, and total contact casts. Those are other tools that they'll use. Um, the other item is, uh, again, hyperbaric chambers. We do have those right here at Brattleboro Hospital. Small percentage of our patients, again, about 2% um, of our patients use hyperbaric chambers. And what those are are actually what they used to use for the bends back in the old days. They still do, as a matter of fact. If somebody goes uh, uh, underwater for too long of a period of time, they build up nitrogen blood and you have to bring them up uh, at certain levels slowly and uh, that's what the beds are. And you basically get the nitrogen out of their blood. Well, in wound care, what you use the hyperbaric chambers for is pressure. Your, um, your whole task, and again, it, it gets a little complicated, but again, trying to get oxygen saturation to the wound, what you do, if you 
right now we're under one atmosphere of pressure, okay? If you uh, go underwater 33 feet, which isn't far, you would be under two atmospheres of pressure. If you take it down to 66 feet, that would be three atmospheres of pressure. Now that's where we usually, they call it dive the patient, okay? Now, what that does is increases your oxygen saturation when you're under three atmospheres of pressure times 10. All right, so again, what we're talking about here, to, to, you know, for the wound to heal, you're looking at getting oxygen and blood to it. Hyperbaric chambers are very effective at doing that. Now, on top of the pressure, you're also diving somebody in pure oxygen. All right, now what that does is right now we're about 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen, roughly. Okay, when you're in a pure oxygen environment and you're diving somebody at three atmospheres, that increases the, the oxygen saturation to 15 to 20 times what it is at sea level. And they slide you in, and it's a glass tube. You have a TV up here so you can watch TV. Because you're in there for about an hour. It takes, you're in there longer, actually. It takes, uh, you've got to uh, descend and then you've got to ascend. So it takes about 15 minutes to do that. So you're actually in at that uh, pressure for about an hour. But it takes about an hour and a half in total. Um, yeah, and you do this five days a week times 30 days. Now again, getting back to our success rate, you know, when I'm mentioning this stuff, is it, what we're doing is a combination of all this stuff. Okay, it's not, you're not doing usually any just one thing. You're doing, you know, you're doing debris, everybody gets debris. That's just a common course of action. Um, depending if you have a pressure wound or not is whether or not you get a cast. In hyperbaric chambers, depending or not, whether or not Medicare will cover it, that's a, that's a big one because they're very, you know, they, they push back a lot, obviously. But it's very effective, and I'll tell you why I think it's effective. It's because the techs, who do the hyperbaric uh, chambers with patients, they are uh, avid defenders of, of uh, hyperbaric chambers. They're nurses. Usually nurses are like, if something doesn't work, they'll tell you. They're like, that doesn't work. You know, they're very outspoken. You know, that's a good attribute of nurses. If something works, they'll defend it. And the nurses that use hyperbaric, that are hyperbaric techs, all speak highly of it. And you can see the results. Um, a patient could be having a very hard time healing, and if you throw them in the chambers for uh, 10, 20 days, it's like magic sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, but a lot of times it does. If you do a head-to-head, -head, it's about a, I think the success rate is something like 70%, um, which is scientifically significant. The problem is you get a lot of physicians that are, uh, that are like, wait a minute, this doesn't do anything but uh, increase pressure and you're doing pure oxygen, what good does that do? Um, if anybody scuba dives, uh, Henry's Law is a weird thing, because I used to scuba dive. And gas pressure is really, physiologically does a lot of different things to you, different properties. And so I can understand, just from Henry's Law, the effectiveness of this. If your skin is uh, dry or if there's no blood getting to the area of the wound, it tends to be dry. There's no moisture there. What you do with these, again, advanced uh, wound um, advanced wound dressings, and you don't usually find these in a primary care office, uh, is they'll be honey-based, they'll be silver-based, and these dressings basically promote a moist bed because that's what you want for the wound. So you're, you're doing the debridement, you're doing the uh, offloading, you're doing the hyperbaric, and you're also doing the, uh, the fact that you're doing a moist bed on, on the wounds to promote, uh, to promote capillary growth. And that's all about promoting capillary growth. So what you're saying makes sense. You wanna keep it moist. And again, these factors that I'm talking about, um, when you come to the wound center, a lot of times, and I need to stress this, uh, again, you have uh, issues, you know, if you have an ulcer on your leg, well, there's a bigger issue than the ulcer on that leg. You know, 
you have diabetes. And a lot of times, people don't go to the doctor on a regular basis. This is how they discover these issues. Because they're like, you know, I can't get rid of this. This isn't healing. And then, you know, you work on it a little bit. And we work closely with uh, the primary care or the specialist. You know, we can't cure that. We can't address the diabetes. Anything we can do is discover it and work on the wound. But there's other physicians that need to work on that aspect of it. So if, I, if, if there's any takeaway from our little chat this morning, it's please don't ignore it. If you, have a, uh, if you or a colleague or a friend have an open wound and it's not healing, uh, please get it, please address it. Uh, it could be diabetes, could be cardiovascular. And again, your, your skin is an organ. And it's your first line of defense your immune system. So if you have a, 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 a wound that's uh, not healing, that's a breach. I mean, there's all kinds of pathogens and MRSA and everything else out there today. And so you want to repair that as fast as possible. So there's multiple reasons to get this fixed, OK? Um, and the reason we're kind of a niche also is that in addition to these you know, hyperbaric and uh, uh, <coughs> fancy uh, wound dressings and debridement. Uh, the doctors are all trained to do this. They go away to Florida to learn how to do this. So even though they're primary care surgeons, they all go to the same school and learn how to do this debridement. The nurses all go to school, away to school. Uh, as a matter of fact, our nurses are wound care certified. And you get good at it. You get focused. And that's what you do day in and day out. And where we are, there's a there's 136 clinical practice guidelines. Basically, that's like a recipe book for how to deal with wounds, if that makes sense. And so um, it's, it's not, the doctor's not trying to think, well, with this wound, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and kind of you know, basing it on their own experience. They can't do that. They're, they're a physician. But these clinical practice guidelines come from like the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Johns Hopkins, they're generated from these academic centers, and they're the best case scenarios on outcomes. Um, so if you get these uh, in one spot, you know, where the physician can go and look up, well, how do I, what's the best way to treat this pressure wound or this type of uh, thing going on, they have a ready source. That's the baseline, and uh, it really works effectively. And, you, and honestly, we have the discipline follow those clinical practice guidelines. You need to stick to it. And, uh, and again, that's why we go back to the success rate of, of 30 days to heal. It is tough on the patient. They're coming in repeatedly. They just don't come in once, and then it's healed in 30 days. They're coming in at least once a week, at least once a week. You know, so they're in there four or five times um, doing this stuff. If they're, under a hyper, if they're going into the hyperbaric chamber, they're in there 30 times. But that's how you that's how you whip this. That's how you uh, get a good heal rate. Um, is the number one type of wound we deal with is diabetic. Uh, uh, and again, these diabetic ulcers can uh, metamorphosize into something much worse than an ulcer. And a lot of times, it leads to uh, amputation. Okay. Um, Depending on the article you read, it can be from 65,000 to 90,000 amputations a year happen just because of diabetic ulcers. Now, if that's not bad enough, and again, from my perspective, if you catch this early enough and you address it, the majority of the time it's not necessary to get an amputation. So from my perspective, it, it, it's, really, uh, it's really unfortunate that there's so many, they're, they're so numerous out there. So in addition to the quality of life issues, if somebody's in a wheelchair, et cetera, I mean, their quality of life is definitely different than when they were mobile walking around. The mortality rate on an amputee over the course of five years is 65%. Now, that's something that's not out there a lot. But I, I think it's something that I look at, and, and that shocked me. I was like, oh my god, in, in today's day and age, why would somebody, why would there be a 65% mortality rate for, you know, post-amputation? That's the stat, because there's all kinds of what they call comorbidities, where, you know, other, uh, other stuff starts happening, other issues start happening. 
So in addition to the fact that, that it's unnecessary to lose a limb, it's even more unnecessary for somebody to lose their life. So I just want to bring this up as, as something, uh, a wound, it, it sounds maybe minor, <coughs> but don't let it, uh, uh, don't let it morph into something uh, that uh, drastic. Um, and we can handle it. We're, we're very good at handling things up front. Um, commercial insurance is they'll cover 90%. Uh, but the patient has to pay out of pocket 10%. And so that, you know, that is our, our everybody's constant <coughs> struggle. Is there's so many, uh, 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 you know, that the rates today are such that there's, you have to pay out like uh, $1,000 before the insurance kicks in. So that's an ongoing challenge, but that's not just us. That's across the board. Um, you know, the deductible, they call it, uh, which is a, a, another big term for the, insurance company saving money from my perspective. Anything else? Thank you for having me.